This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I've been working here for about three and a half years or so, and that's when I started looking at blogs. Um, when I first came here, I was setting up a project to um, do the podcast and um, some re- online research training material for the Institute of Historical Research. So I was asked to do a project blog for that, and I had no idea at the, that time what to do with a blog. Um, I was told, your project officer, do it as a kind of sort of updates as a project officer. So I kind of tried to do that, but it took me quite a long time to actually find my feet. And I, But once I did do, I actually found it that I really like blogs and I've done quite a lot with them since. I've um, done a bit of research on them as well, which I'll talk about in a second, but also just using them myself, I actually really like what they do, but I've always been a little bit confused at what they actually can do beyond just just me and enjoying writing really so that's where that all begins um, today I'm basically going to talk about blogs within so- social media um, what it's all about why why we might be doing it um, then going to a bit of background um, what types of blogs there are um, both academic and ones relating to archives um, do archives use blogs uh, what I've done is a very brief small survey of um, sort of archive websites and tried to sort of find out a bit about what's actually happening in the archives at the moment or not in the, as the case might be and a few final thoughts and um, some sort of tips about blogging is how I will end um, okay so first of all I'm just going to start with a very basic sort of idiot's guide to what social media and blogging is so sorry if this seems a bit simplistic, but I just want to sort of start off by sort of reminding us what we're talking about. Um, this is how the Oxford English Dictionary describes it. Um, websites and applications which enable users to create and share content or to participate in social networking. Um, in itself, it doesn't really say much, but basically what it is, is this sort of thing. Um, all sorts of tools, um, websites, platforms, programs, online, um, which cover all sorts of things from text, so blogs and Twitter and things like that, to sort of information encyclopedias like Wikipedia, videos, YouTube, images, Flickr, even sort of computer games, which have got a social element to them. So there's all sorts of um, things that this covers. Um, so basically the idea is to create some kind of content, to share that content with others, and network or at least discuss, debate it, get the, get the sort of message out there in some form or another. So it all depends on what you want to do with it. Um, blogs, let's sort of tie it down a bit more. This is how um, blogs are described, a personal website or web page on which an individual records opinions, links to other sites, etc. on a regular basis. It's a very basic, doesn't really do it justice to be honest. Um, this is just a few examples of what a blog can be, and there's probably many, many others. So an online notebook, um, a hub for your research, promotional activity, news items, acting as a journal, um, it's just storing images even. So there's a lot of different uses, and I'd say there's probably a lot more than that. So they can be multi-purpose. There's many reasons why you might want to do sort of use a blog. Um, OK, I'm just going to quickly talk about where I come into this. Uh, Last year, I got a scholarship from the um, Social Media Knowledge Exchange project. They were an HRC-funded project to um, create some scholarships about social media. So you'd have individual people looking into elements of social media. And what I chose was blogs. So blogging for historians was the subject that I chose. Created a website, or a blog even, which I could discuss blogs, look into them a little bit more. And the main crux of it was to interview various different people, experts in their fields who were um, already blogging, um, one of which was Margaret here. Um, Sorry, (laughs) but I'll be talking about you later. Um, (laughs) But yeah, basically basically there's a whole series of um, podcasts of interviewing people, just trying to find out what, what best practice there was, what was already happening, why people started blogging in the first place. From there, there was also a serv- an online survey which actually didn't do that well, but it did bring out a few vaguely interesting results. And to, at the end of that, create a toolkit or guide to blogging, which could be used by people to, who just want to start out and learn what kind of things you might want to do with a blog or what you might not, and so forth. Um, so that, oh, sorry, that's the outputs of the, um, of the project. Um, 
this is a bit of a blurb about what I was doing. So the project investigates the use of blogs by archives, libraries and historians on both an individual and an organisational level. It seeks to exchange knowledge of the working and usefulness of blogs between the history profession and the archives and library sector through the creation of an online resource designed to gain an insight into why blogging is useful and what is gained from the process. So that's basically what it was about. These are all the um, people that I um, interviewed for, for this. Um, I tried to get a variety of different types of blogs and different people from different um, places. So um, you've got archives and library blogs, so the obvious ones were sort of to go for was the British Library and National Archives. Um, an individual research blog who was Professor Tim Hitchcock, who's um, the person behind um, uh, Criminal Intent and um, the Old Bailey Online proceedings and so forth. Then I wanted some of the collaborative blogs, so people that are actually doing this together. So there was one that was a kind of topic-based one around Russian history, one that was a departmental, a Department of History blog um, at Sheffield, as that example was. And then finally, what something completely off the wall, which is a blog aggregator, somebody who's actually linking all these together and creating a sort of a useful index for people. Um, I'll talk about all of these um, at various different points um, briefly today. Um, hopefully, if this will work, I've just got a few choice snippets from these interviews, which we'll see if this does do actually pay. Uh, enthusiasm on the part of the blogger, they have to want to write their writing um, and they have to want to share something. Um, and we're very lucky in that everyone on the blog has volunteered, everyone wants to be doing it. Um, most of the time they're, they're asking for more ways to contribute as well. Um, and yeah, and sort of that sort of passion, enthusiasm and expertise, because they are experts in their own particular area, that really comes through. I think it's going to be entertaining. You aren't expecting people to um, have to make the effort to read it. It should, it should just flow. It should be a, a nice snappy piece. So it should be clear and concisely written, not in the style of a scholarly article with tons of footnotes, because we have had things people can't snap out of the way of writing for scholarly journals, and you have to try and nudge them into something quite different. It's, it's quite a challenge. Um, I like people writing short sentences. Three to five hundred words maximum we've set. If it's anything longer than about seven or eight hundred words, people tend to switch off because it looks too long on the page. If it is presented in very long blocks of text, uh, then it, people again tend to, your bounce rate gets very high because um, people get intimidated by those things on a screen. The number of words looks more for some reason, it's just a sort of mental thing about reading on a screen. Okay. So that's just a few sort of examples from the um, pod, from the podcasts, and they're all on blo on the blog itself. If you want to sort of check out the full interviews, um, onto the survey very very briefly. Um, I asked various different questions. In one of them was, how often do you visit blogs to people? And as you can see, there's quite a diversity of an answer. There's more people I only visit a few times, but that some were over twenty quite easily. So it, there was no real consensus there. Um, asking about the sort of different features that blogs have. It was mainly things which allowed you to find content that was popular. So having Twitter feeds, so making a connection outside of the blog to advertise and promote it. Having categories so you can find the type of topic that you're interested in. Um, lists of the past posts, um, an option to follow the blog so you can automatically receive updates. They were the kind of things that people were most interested in. So sort of other things like tag clouds and stuff like that were somehow less popular. Um, and calendars and so forth. Um, if you write individual or as a solo, most said that they wrote so, um, did it solo. solo. Um, I suspect there's a lot more that do actually do it collaboratively as well um, than what this suggests. I think if you got a wider amount of people, you would find that out. Um, and then finally, as I say, there was a tool toolkit which I've been creating on the uh, blog itself, which um, the categories are there. Um, just giving you an idea of what, what sort of things it looks into. And that's designed as a kind of introduction to blogs. Okay, so moving on. What types of blogs are there? The, during the project, this is the um, types of blogs that I identified, which were 
sort of generally the type of things that you'll get. So you get research blog, point of view, um, sharing blogs, so sort of collaborative between institutions or, as I say, scholarly um, events focused or project. So I'm just going to go through a few of those as examples. Um, the Histrionics blog by him, Tim Hitchcock, which I mentioned earlier. Um, basically, he used this as an experimental place where he might put up a few sort of for bits and pieces of, of stuff which he can't really find anywhere else for. It's not right for an article or for proper publication, but it's something that he'd like to get out there that might be of interest to um, his peers. So that's why, why he uses it. He describes his use of it as chaotic and undirected, so there's no real thought going on behind that. It's just getting information out there, and that's literally all he wants it for. Um, Early Modern Women, Culture of Knowledge. This is a blog that belongs to a postgraduate researcher walking towards an MPhil, um, and this is what they said um, about the blog. I'm new to blogging, but I'm hoping to create blogs of interest, reflection and or casual ramblings, as well as generate a network of feedback and related discussions. So they're basically talking about their research in a more informal way, um, presumably hoping to get a bit noticed, get some, some interest around their subject, and it's a way to sort of actually formulate their ideas there. Going on to something quite different, point of view blog, um, this is probably the most sort of well-known example, um, Madonna's Life by Mayo Beard. Um, basically, this is a blog on the um, Times Online, which has been turned into a book by herself and is proved very popular. So she talks about academia, about her life as, as, as a Don, is basically the idea. Um, so you can actually have it about sort of your day-to-day -day working life and people might find that interesting. Um, this is another one of the ones I interviewed, um, the History Matters blog at the Department of History Sheffield. They have a very good idea of how to work as a, as a department basically on this because they needed something that would excite everyone in the department with diversity of interests. I mean they're all historians but they'll work on things from, right through to, from the classical age right through to modern day and lots of different topics within that. So it's a way to bring them all together under the idea of sort of public history. Why does it matter? What's important about it? So what they've done is choose, chosen that theme as what, why does history matter and got um, people to talk about that in various different forms. And it's proven very popular and actually has worked really well. It's very engaging and interesting as well. Um, so that's definitely a blog that's well worth looking at. Um, Another example of a shared blog is the Russian History blog. This is all about, obviously, Russian history, but it's shared between scholars with a similar interest. Um, so most of them are in the US, there's a few in the UK, and they basically, it allows them to blog less often, but still to have a presence. And they can also read each other's blog posts, discuss that on the blog itself, and it's, it's a forum for discussion and debate about their topic. So it's actually... It started because they were frustrated with book reviews taking forever to come out. And it does include quite a few book reviews straight onto the blog, but it includes lots of other things along with that. And that seems to be a good way for them to actually discuss their research in a sort of international way without too much effort on anyone's part. Um, an events blog, an example is sort of the people I work for, SAS. Um, they basically put up news items, events and so forth and it's using it very much as a kind of to promote activities. And that can prove quite sort of a good way to do it because you can talk about the activities, you can still talk about research and other things, but a mix of all those actually pr can prove to be fairly interesting and hopefully get people to pay some attention to it. Um, example of a project blog is the Commonwealth Oral History Project, which has only just started. It's literally a new project. Um, and obviously you're talking about a pro specific project the problem with a project blog is once the project's ended, what happens to the blog? Um, where's the impetus to continue it? So if you do have a project and you want to have a blog, you do need to consider that and maybe consider actually having it as part of a bigger institution blog and as having it as that kind of category in there. So it's a question of where you want to place that. Okay, let's move on to the archives. Um, one of these are various different archive blog, um, blogs that exist out there. What I did was survey about 113 different archive websites um, on the beginning of this month just to see what kind of social media they seem to be on there. Um, it's, it's not complete by any means, but it sort of gave me a kind of good sample of actually understanding what's happening. Um, out of the 113, only 26 had a blog. Um, 
39 had Twitter and Facebook had 43. A lot of those had all three or just two of those. So there, there is a mix there. Um, on the Twitter and Facebook, a lot of them, because they've got a website itself as part of the council, I haven't included the generics sort of council Twitter and Facebook account because they're likely to, if they talk about the archives, not so much. Um, other social media, which I didn't really investigate, but they does seem quite popular, is Flickr and YouTube. And again, and they are used to various degrees. Sometimes it's just a few images put up on Flickr. Other times there's something quite interesting being done. Um, so, okay, so use by the type of archive. So I'm sort of aware that there's different types. So there's national, local, ecclesiastical, university-based. So the total, most of the ones I was looking at were local, regional ones. Um, and they, by far, had the, sort of the least amount of social media on them. Um, better at sort of Facebook and Twitter than they are at blogs. National, again, was better, was better, but sort of not all of them were doing this, and the same for all the other ones there. So quite often they're, they're kind of limited on what they're actually trying to do there, which was, was kind of interesting. Um, a quick look at what type of systems they were using. Most have gone for WordPress. Um, a few have gone for Blogger and Typepad, and there's a few that's just incorporated into their own website in some form or another. Um, so WordPress is definitely seems to be the most favoured at the moment, which is a general trend in, in blogs in general. And these are just an example of all the different blogs that um, seem to appear there. Um, using Twitter, so by far the most, by a long way for followers, is British Library, um, ridiculously many more than everyone else but National Archives is um, close, closest nearest to it and then you sort of slowly go down the sort of list there but um, for the most part Twitter seems to be when it's used it's being used quite well um, I mean the f most of these have got quite a few followers so when it is being used it does seem to be getting at least some people interested and um, paying attention to it. For Facebook very similar sort of um, statistics really, um, British Library out in front, National Archives behind and then it slowly goes down from there. Um, one of the things I wanted to check was sort of the frequency of posts, as if that sort of makes a difference and the majority are doing sort of you know, around about three to five a month, give or take, so most of the, the kind of lower half of that it's sort of around about three posts a month. Um, Obviously, there are some that do a lot more than that, some pretty much one per day, so it does vary. But as you can see, the majority are sort of making it, keeping it active, but not overdoing it. Um, most also were created within the last two to three years, sort of 2011 onwards, really. So there's a few that goes earlier. Um, Media Archive for Central England, they started in 2005, and I suspect that's a kind of news news thing which was converted into a blog rather than actually being a blog at the beginning but I might be wrong on that, I, have, I don't know Ok, so a few examples um, the Angus Library and Archive was one of the um, blogs I looked at um, they seem to put up three to four posts per month and it started with some funding so they actually got some money to actually be able to start this up as a sort of an outreach activity and it's started off with a sort of fairly focused kind of examination of the archives and then it's moved out into more to explore more um, about their about their collections. And they've done this quite well. They explored the various different collections in sort of short blog posts. Um, this one up here is an exhibition that they talk about um, that they've got coming up or actually on at the moment. Um, another example is the Birmingham City Archives, the Iron Room. Um, that opened up a few years ago and has a few more posts per month um, and they want basically this to help people find more, find out what they do, how they go about working in a, using an archive, what collections they have and so forth. Um, so they want, want this to play, play a place sort of discovery basically and outreach. Um, they have behind the scenes posts as well which are particularly nice because it kind of gives you a kind of a glimpse behind things which most public wouldn't actually see. Um, National Archives blog, um, they're the, again one of the ones I interviewed. Um, the goal of that was to have an in more informal and personal voice. Um, obviously National Archives has to have a formal voice most of the time where it's, sort of, it's still kind of a we type of thing. This, the blog allows a bit more of an I 
um, you get to sort of see the personal viewpoint and, and a bit of understanding of what archivists actually do. Um, one of the things that's very difficult for the public to see quite often is what, what is the job of an archivist, what do they actually do, what kind of things can they offer. And a blog is a nice informal place to actually be able to do that. People can actually read that and go, actually, okay, I understand that now. Um, an example actually from the British Library, I believe, a blog actually talked about the white gloves, which I've heard both National Archives and British Library talk about that sort of on television, you see them all in white gloves and actually no, nobody really uses the white gloves in reality. And a blog post is actually being created, I think, by British Library talking about that. And now they just pass people on straight to that blog post and say, have a look here, this is where we describe why that's the case. So it can be used in that kind of way and sort of and get maybe a controversial issue and discussed. Um, British Library has various different blogs, so I've, I've just talked about the Untold Lives blog, um, which was one of the ones I interviewed. Um, basically, um, two, there's two people acting as gatekeeper for that, um, Margaret being one of them. Um, and basically, blog posts are scheduled in, um, there's some backup posts ready to um, go at any moment. Um, and again, it's about transparency, it's about openness, it's about being a bit more informal or human voice. Um, and it's been sort of a different way to actually sort of introduce people to the archive or to the library in this case. Sorry. Okay, um, so a few sort of elements here. Um, I wanted to get sci-fi into my post at some point and I finally managed to do it. Um, be trendy or be exterminated. Basically, this is a post from the Wiltshire and Swindon History Centre. Um, and they're talking basically about Doctor Who being filmed in the locality. Um, the post went up on the 22nd, just before the Doctor Who 50th anniversary. So they're using an event that's popular in the media, that's been talked about, and actually putting a blog post up about that, that reflects their collection or their locality. And that's a way just to occasionally get yourself noticed if you're doing a blog, just to get people paying attention to you. You can imagine if somebody sort of Googles Dot Who, this might have a chance of coming up and people might sort of go, oh, that is interesting, hopefully. So it's a way of just having a bit of um, interest around, around the sort of things that you do generally. Um, getting your message out there. One of the things we do in SAS is to talk about the blog posts on Twitter and Facebook, other social media. So we don't just focus on the blog itself. That is the starting point. Um, you consider that or a news item as the basis and then from there you mention it on a few tweets, you talk about it on Facebook briefly or wherever else, um, have it as a focus for an email, sort of sending out an email as well. So it's a way to engage people, to get people to notice what events is happening or what in piece of interest you've got going on. So that's another way of actually talking about blogs is to actually not just focus on the blog itself because you probably would struggle to get people to pay attention that way but actually to use other things to actually get people looking at it and also have a link on your website. Um, one of the things I did notice on quite a few of the um, archive websites, not all of them made it very clear where their social media is. Do they have a Twitter or Facebook account? I couldn't necessarily always find very easily. Same with the blog, it wasn't always obvious. So, and that's not just archives, I've seen that quite a lot on other websites as well. They, they hide them away. Um, until recently, the Institute of Historical Research was great for that because they have a page about social media, what social media we have. But if you can find it, you've done better than I could and I worked for them, so it was very difficult. Now they have it on their front page and you can actually find this information a lot easier. Um, it's so easy just to hide it away in something that makes sense to the web creator, but not necessarily to the public. So it needs, it needs to be sort of put much more forward, basically. Um, if you're actually doing a, a social media campaign, so actually really sort of pushing something with social media, which does take time, does require a lot of effort, it can actually have results. Um, this is the SAS blog before the campaign, and it went up. And when it did dip again, it didn't dip anywhere near as far so it did actually have an impact people paid a bit more attention to the blog and to hopefully turn up to events as a process of that um, so it can work but again that does require effort and quite a bit of time so it's, it's something to consider um, building up a profile online is another thing that you can do with blogs so 
this is something um, Mark Carrigan, who's a sociology um, student, has done. Um, basically, he's got various different blogs that he works on, some of which is just his own, others are collaborative. And he's using it very much as a sort of an enhanced profile page, so where a lot of people have their profile just as part of a website. He's more or less rejected that idea and created it as part of his blog. So on his blog, he's got information about himself, his CV, um, all the blog posts relating to all the stuff and things he's interested in, um, publication lists and all these sort of things in one place. And although, yes, that is kind of showing yourself off maybe a little too much for most of us, it is a way to actually put everything together. And he says that actually what he does is use it as, as a notebook, basically. He will put ideas onto the blog. It makes him focus on those ideas by having to turn vague thoughts into a proper bit of prose. And it's there for him to look at, as well as for other people. So there's two purposes in a way. It shows off what he does, but also gives him a place where he's actually located. It's a file system, in a sense, and a public file system. So there's, there's kind of a two-way thing for that. But obviously, that becomes quite central to his research purposes in both promoting that research as well as actually aiding him creating it. So it involves a lot of time, but it's part of his process. So it's where, how the time is best spent. Um, this is one that I was involved with a few years ago, which is turning a blog into a virtual conference. So this is something random that you could do as a sort of slightly something different. Basically, the idea was to post blog posts just over a one-week period um, that came out of a conference. So there were audio recordings from the conference, which we were able to share um, and spread them out throughout the week. There were a sort of articles, mini articles and opinion pieces created specifically for for the blog and we put them out at a scheduled time which was made quite public when that was going to be put on there and tried to get people to engage and discuss around that and to comment and it actually worked really well. Um, we got, I can't remember the exact numbers, but thousands of hits on that week and it still continues now even though we haven't posted anything on it since it actually went up that time. It continues to have conversation going, it continues to have interests. Um, I think I, I was looking at it and had about 100, 100 odd people viewing today, which, and going back for the last sort of month, it has at least 30 to 40 people each day, and that's us doing nothing. It's just an archived thing now. So sometimes doing something slightly different can get some, a lot of it's a good and interesting subject, can actually do something kind of interesting. And in a disappointing sense, in a way, none of my other blogs do as well as this one, and I don't do anything on that anymore. So maybe it says something, I don't know. Um, and then this was one of the other ones I mentioned earlier about a blog aggregator. Um, this was a creation of, for early modern blogs. So if, you want, if you're interested in the early modern period, definitely have a look at this site because it aggregates lots of different early modern blogs from sort of literature, history, archives and so forth and collects them in sort of interesting ways. So it's basically it will create a kind of blog role of them, so a list of the different blogs the, some of the posts that they've got, it gives you different ways to access them and get information. Um, so it's, it's a really good idea because it allows you to actually find blogs and find, find content which would be difficult to find otherwise. Um, I'd it'd be nice if other, other sort of people did this. Uh, there was sort of a mod medieval commons blog or so forth for different kind of subject areas because finding the content, if you're interested in some content, is actually very difficult. Blogs can stay hidden and be very difficult to find sometimes. Um, okay, lastly, I'm just going to do a quick plug for something I'm involved in right now, which is the Social Scholar Seminar. Um, this is basically a lunchtime public seminar that's run, at, um, run by the School of Advanced Study. Um, and we basically have an hour session where somebody, will, an expert, will talk about social media. Um, for, for 20 odd minutes and then we'll discuss it so this is a kind of open invite if anyone is interested in social media and can spare lunch time usually on a Wednesday um, once per month then it's, it's worth attending we do also on the SAS blog also have um, usually a video recording and some online content relating to it as well so if you want to sort of look at the past ones we can that is provided um, this is the sessions we've had so far and 4th of December is the next one which is um, Anne Alexander. So um, just something that's um, possible to attend if you would like to. And yeah, as I say, it's on the SAS website and their blog, so if you wanted to look. 
Okay, um, I'll be ending here. A um, few conclusions. Um, if you want to start a blog in any kind of way, really think about what it is you're blogging about. Be, it needs to be something that you're enthusiastic about because if it's something that you're thinking, oh, I've got to do this, you're not likely to be able to continue it on. You need to make sure that you're interested and that this is going to be something that you can continue. Um, despite common wisdom, it's not always necessary to blog regularly. Um, it depends what the purpose is. If it's very much a promotional activity, you probably do need to post more regularly. But if it's just something that occasionally will get interest, then you don't necessarily have to. And you can still, people will find that post um, through Google, if nothing else. Um, it very much depends what the purpose is. Consider shared blogging, because the complaint that you, I often hear is that there's not enough time in the day to actually do this, which is very true. If you share a blog, if you're not just the only one posting on it, you could, if there's say five of you, you only need to do maybe a post sort of every month or two at most, maybe even less than that. So it's something that's worth um, doing. And also you can read what other people are doing, you can comment, you can discuss on the blog itself and use it as a bit of a forum. Um, as an institution as well, it's quite useful for actually joining up what you all do. And then, yeah, blogging individually is also good. So don't, don't give up on that if you do like to do that. And that's about everything. So thank you very much for listening.